Greetings, brothers and sisters, and welcome to our Sovereign Love of God series. Uh, this is part one of our larger story of God, our sacred roots. We are focusing on the Holy Spirit as our helper, as the paraclete. And particularly this time, we're going to look at the Holy Spirit as power, the power that animates and that energizes the church. Uh, we'll look at 1 Corinthians 12, 4 through 7, and see Paul talk there about the Holy Spirit as power. Uh, just to look broader, this is the, the whole story. This is where we're sort of taking all of our themes and teachings. Um, and these eight topics cover the triune God's work as narrated in Scripture and our response, participation in God's story. The objective foundation of the story is what God is doing. This is true whether we believe it or not, whether we like it or not. The Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are acting in history to bring about his own purposes, and that's narrated to us in the Word. And so our focus on the Holy Spirit uh, highlights these themes of him as life giver and teacher, helper, guide, um, and particularly as we look at him as our helper, we see him as the empowering one, as the one who um, energizes us as the church. There's a very famous prayer called the Serenity Prayer, um, and you'll see it on posters and all sorts of other things. It actually traces back to the 30s to a guy named Reinhold Niebuhr, and this was the original form of it. He said, Father, give us courage to change what must be altered, serenity to accept what cannot be helped, and the insight to know the one from the other. Uh, I like this prayer, and particularly as we talk about the Holy Spirit as power, um, there is this sense in which we're going to focus on this phrase, the courage to change what much must be altered. The, the Holy Spirit is the one who um, not only gives us the wisdom to know the difference, to know when we need to stand back, but particularly gives us the power to act, the power to move and to work and to have our actions be meaningful and effective uh, for the glory of God and for his kingdom. The, the courage to change what must be altered is, is another way of talking about what I mean when I say the power of the Holy Spirit. We're gonna look at that in 1 Corinthians 12, four through seven. And we're gonna ex exegete that scripture text, then we'll explore the theme in scripture and then experience one of the themes takeaways. So if we look at second, uh, 1 Corinthians 12 and see the broader context here, uh, Paul begins this chapter by saying, now concerning spiritual gifts. This is important in 1 Corinthians because apparently Paul has received a report back with several questions or issues. And uh, you'll see this throughout 1 Corinthians if you read it. It says, now concerning this, now concerning that. And it's, he's answering a particular issue that has been presented to him. Uh, from the church in Corinth. So spiritual gifts is something that has come up. Um, he talks about their former devotion to mute idols. He says, you, you're not used to, uh, you're used to mute idols, these, these idols that don't say anything. Uh, you have a present devotion to a living and speaking God, and that means something totally different. That is uh, a whole different ball game, and you're not used to that, and you need to understand that. Uh, and he goes on here, and he talks about the, the spiritual gifts then, the the ways that this living and active God expresses uh, his life in us. It says, now there are varieties of gifts, but the same spirit. There are varieties of service, but the same Lord. There are varieties of activities, but it is the same God who empowers them all in everyone. To each one is given the manifestation of the spirit for the common good. So Paul here addresses spiritual gifts, and he does so by setting up a kind of um, parallel way of talking about it. He's, he talks about the varieties of, but the same. He talks about there's a variety of gifts from the same spirit, a variety of services from the same Lord, a variety of activities, the same God. Um, and so he's setting these things up in parallel. Um, he's putting these together and he's putting these together. Uh, I've heard some people try to sort of parse out all the differences between what these things mean, but I agree with one commentator who said, if we're, if we're trying to differentiate between gifts and services and activities, we're probably missing the point 
of what Paul is saying here. He's, he's really highlighting different ways of talking about the same thing, different facets of God's activity in us. And, and at the end, he actually sort of summarizes all of these with another parallel. He says that the gifts, services, and activities can be summarized as manifestations. Uh, and then the Spirit, the Lord, the God is of the Spirit. So these manifestations of the Spirit, these showings, these evidences of the presence of the Spirit in us sort of summarize the gifts, services, activities of the Spirit, Lord God among us. And so these things, they, they sort of all go together um, and paint this picture of spiritual gifts. Um, and in, so in addition to these parallels, that's, that's where you see a lot of what Paul has to say about these things. He adds little phrases here and there. So the activities uh, from the various activities from the same God who empowers them all in everyone. Empowers there um, is actually the Greek word for energy. It's ener energizes. Um, it, other, other translations have it as activates. He activates. It's, uh, he powers them. He turns them on and uh, keeps them going. He, he is the one who actually makes the difference between um, a gifted uh, teacher standing up in the church and talking and a motivational speaker getting up and talking at some other conference. The difference is that God energizes the gifted teacher for his work and energizes every gift, every service in everyone. Um, and then he says, to each is given the manifestation. Um, he, he highlights here the individuality, that God has in fact, not just given gifts in general to the church and not just given gifts to some, but to each, to everyone is given a manifestation. That every one of us, no matter who we are, no matter our station, no matter what, anything about us, um, if we are in the Lord, if we have the Holy Spirit, we are given a way to manifest that, a way to show that, a way to serve God, activities we can do, gifts we can share. Uh, to each is given the manifestation of the Spirit, and then you have the purpose for the common good. The manifestation of the Spirit is for the common good. It's never for uh, the lifting up of a person. It's never for personal glory or gain. It's never for um, any purpose except the common good the serving of the church, the serving of the world. Uh, these things are the, the purpose of the manifestations of the Spirit. It never has to do with our sort of personal ambitions and personal glory. It's always for the common good that, that these are given. And Paul then summarizes this. He goes through several examples of these gifts and services and activities and talks about wisdom and knowledge and uh, miracles and tongues and prophecy and all of these different things. And then he summarizes this in verse 12. He says, all these are empowered or energized again by one and the same spirit who apportions to each one individually as he wills. So he, he highlights again here this, this sort of individually, each one, um, and it's under his own will. It's, it's his own discretion and his own, God's own uh, purposes that determine the apportionment of the gifts and the services, who will do what and what the needs are and all of those things. The spirit directs, it's like a, an orchestra. The spirit is, is directing and each, each one has, we each have our part. Um, we each have our individual things to play, um, but it is the spirit who is apportioning to each one individually as he wills. This text then is going to go on to talk about some of the, the more famous um, images of the church. It actually goes on to talk about us as a body um, and, and us as members of that body. He's gonna, he says that we are baptized into one body, no matter our ethnicity, status, race, gender, any of these things, that all of us have been made to partake of one spirit and we're baptized into one body. And so then he goes on to say, um, just as... The, the one body has different parts, so we have different parts. And it's not as if you, your right hand is more important than your left hand, or your um, eyeball is more important than your toe, or that, that there is this equality in the body and this interconnectedness in all of us. Um, and the picture here is that um, all of us together, all of the uh, gifts and services and activities, when, when we operate together, when we respect one another, honor one another, that together we actually manifest God's presence in the world. 
when Christ came into the world, um, he said the kingdom of God is at hand. And he went about doing good. He went about healing and teaching and uh, performing miracles and feeding people and doing all of these things. And what those were is manifestations that the kingdom of God had come. It was proof. It was evidence that God was present. God is now present with us. And these gifts of the Spirit, these services, these manifestations of the Spirit are evidence that the kingdom of God has come, that the kingdom of God is coming. The Spirit of God empowers the people of God to manifest the kingdom of God. That is the theme that we're going to look at uh, in Scripture. The Spirit of God empowers the people of God to manifest the kingdom of God. We demonstrate in our lives and in our midst that God's kingdom has come. The author of Hebrews, reflecting on what happened in Acts, which we'll look at, he says, Salvation was declared first by the Lord, and it was attested to us by those who heard, while God also bore witness by signs and wonders and various miracles, and by gifts of the Holy Spirit distributed according to his will. Now you see there the exact same language even that Paul uses. Um, and what he says here is that the signs, the wonders, the gifts, all of these things, they are to attest uh, the salvation declared by the Lord. They are to attest, to confirm that uh, the gospel is true, that the kingdom has come, that Christ is Lord. Uh, on Pentecost, when the Holy Spirit comes and you know, 3,000 people are saved, they're all baptized, they all receive the Holy Spirit. This is what the text says. They devote themselves to the apostles' teaching, to fellowship, to the breaking of bread, to prayers. They're all at, in awe of all these wonders and signs. They have all of their stuff in common. They're selling their belongings, sharing everything as anyone has needs. They're, they're worshiping day by day. They're receiving communion, sharing their food generously. They're praising God. God is adding to their numbers day by day. So what you see immediately is the Spirit of God has come. And the evidence of God's kingdom, the manifestation of God's kingdom, the showing of God's kingdom. And you even see here the seed of a lot of what later will be talked about as spiritual gifts. The teaching and the faith and the generosity um, and the hospitality and, and all, all of these things. You, you sort of see them forming in this early church. These people of God are empowered by the spirit of God and they are manifesting the kingdom of God. Lest you think this is a New Testament phenomenon, though, you can actually look back in the Old Testament and you can see this in several places. In Exodus 35, God empowered uh, particular builders of the tabernacle with unique skill to be able to fulfill what he had asked them to do. Uh, and everywhere in Judges, but particularly with Samson and Judges 14, you see when he needs to accomplish something, the Spirit of God rushes on him. Um, and same with David, when he's anointed to be king, the Spirit of God began to come upon him um, that day. Um, and then Ezekiel too is kind of representative of a lot of the prophets, but Ezekiel, uh, God fills him with his Holy Spirit so he can stand and so he can receive his call and his commission as a prophet and be um, empowered to do what he is supposed to do. This is the way God has always worked. The Spirit of God has always empowered the people of God to manifest the kingdom of God. So experiencing one of the themes takeaways, it, it, just to be clear, the Spirit of God is empowering us to manifest the kingdom of God. We are, the, as the people of God, we are empowered to demonstrate God's kingdom in the world today. If you want to take something away with you, I would say just do something. Just do something. You have the Holy Spirit. So in accordance with God's word, of course, uh, not violating the word of God and, and doing something for our love of God, because not for personal glory, but for the love of God. Of course, imitating Christ, doing it as Christ would do um, and operating by the power of the Holy Spirit, not just um, going off on our own, doing whatever we want. And we should also talk to godly leaders. So these are very broad parameters though. If we are sitting around waiting for God to do something, for God to manifest his kingdom in the world, uh, but we aren't doing anything, then we're, we're completely missing the boat. The kingdom of God is being made manifest in us, through us. Just do something. Again, this is what Paul says, to each is given the manifestation of the spirit for the common good. You have been given the manifestation of the Holy Spirit for the common good. An American poet, Walt Whitman, says it this way. He says, the powerful play goes on and you may contribute a verse. We have been adopted into the plot line of God's own story. 
the powerful play goes on. We have the opportunity to, to contribute a verse. Brothers and sisters, by the power of the Holy Spirit, just do something. Manifest God's kingdom in the world to the glory of God in the name of Jesus. Amen. Oh.